I think the first time you and I met was over the moral imperative. I think that was the work about Catholicism in Spain and the church taking the side of the fascists and making a complete fool of itself. You know, I took a much more simplistic approach. It looked to me like somebody was giving the fingers <laughs> to religion and I thought that was a damn good idea. You became chair of Fishing Game, when was that? 2000. 2000. I, I stood for the, in the 2000 of the 1999 election for Fishing Game and I was elected and I was made chairman. My first meeting with, with Fishing Game was as chairman. Right. Um, there was a lot of internecine war going on between the old council and no. goose hunters <laughs> and I think I was seen as a neutral body <laughs> to their chagrin. Tell me about the demise of all those rivers in your lifetime. I mean it's a, it's a simple story really. I mean when I was about 11 or 12 um, I, I was bought a fishing rod and mum would pack me a cut lunch and I'd go and fish the Avon and the Heathcote and the Kashmir stream and I would be occupied for a full day and I'd come home happy and tired and satisfied. Um, as I got older, I began to spread my, my interest a little further afield and I'd go out to the sticks in the south branch of the Waimak. I could cycle there and I came and fished the Akana and the Akuti and the Kaituna, L2, Selwyn, the Earlwell, Hearts Creek. And slowly over time, these rivers were being taken away from us. Uh, the Earlwell uh, got to a point where it was one of the first to, to dry as a result of, of, of water abstraction and of course dry riverbed no fishing. So the lowland fisheries had, had, had largely disappeared, the foothills fishery had, had changed in nature and the whole exercise became one of um, less enjoyment and, and with that less enjoyment I guess more of a focus on what was, what was causing it. So the memories that you and I share of the rivers, once we go, then they'll all disappear and that leaves room for the revisionists to come in and change the history. It's an intergenerational thing, isn't it? And I can remember, uh, I think it was an ECAN representative, talking about the Waikari as an insignificant stream. <laughs> and after his comments and at some part of the, the proceedings, I showed him these photographs of me standing up to my waist in water with large fish that we'd caught in the Waikari. Mm. And he couldn't believe that that was the same piece of water that he knew. It was only a matter of, what, maybe five, eight years that that change had occurred. What's going to happen? Will we get those rivers back? I doubt it. Um, climate change is going to impact on it to a degree. But I think there's too much money invested. And we just seem unable to make the right decisions uh, to bring rivers back. Um, we compromise, and we're always compromising a little bit more and a little bit less. When you were in business, you were representing the company and you had the unions to sort of struggle with, and yet it, it sounded like they respected you because you were pretty straight with them. There were two perspectives, theirs and the company's. Right. And as long as you had an honest story to tell, then you had a chance of reaching a settlement that was fair. Okay. So then you started working with water, you found yourself, you formed a group with Murray Rogers called the Water Rights Trust, and then you had to deal with politicians, how was that? That was quite different. <laughs> and after 10, 12 years of doing this, I found that rather than dealing in these environments with integrity and fairness, I was beginning to feel angry. Because each time we appeared to provide the logic which affected or would affect some change for the better, the rules were changed. And they were either changed by the regulators or the government. And I mean, it culminated, of course, in, in, in the disbandment of, of Environment Canterbury and a group of commissioners appointed by government to facilitate what the government wanted to achieve. Did you ever try to deal with them, with the commissioners? Well, I, one of the commissioners had been a, a school friend, someone, <laughs> and it was very difficult. Yeah. Um, the chair ha had a view that. Um, she was there to affect what the government wanted and that didn't seem to be a much relationship to what science was telling those with eyes to see. So in the past you've worked collaboratively but now there was a brick wall up and you couldn't get beyond that wall, mm. is that how it was? Yeah. Correct. A and it began to become all consuming and I began to develop an anger around it mm. a and that began to, to impact on my family. It's an interesting point because it's impacted on all of us, I think, and the worst 
part is when you're in the hills with your family and you realize you've got to get back a day early to write a submission and knowing very well that submission was going to be put in a waste paper basket because no one is really listening. Mm -hmm. At which stage, what do you do? Well, short of insurrection, yeah. I'm not sure what you do. I mean, we live in a democracy and we, and, and we espouse the principle, the democratic principles that that, that entails. But politicians and developers have a, a weight of, of, of influence that seems to be able to override uh, good science and common sense.